Hey guys, it's Kendra. And this is Jessica. And you're listening to Lucid Lab. We're getting started a little bit late today. I know, it's kind of weird. I got caught in an accident. Not only are we recording late, but I ended up getting here 20 minutes later than I was supposed to because I-25, there's always an accident. Always. But today it was a really kind of scary one. Uh, They had the whole right lane closed, so they were making us all get over. And then as I get up, there's just hay everywhere. Like it looks like what you'd see in a stable amount of hay. And there's this big old tractor trailer pulled over with those huge round bales, like the the ones that probably. Yeah. And so something happened and those came off the back of the truck. And all I could think of was like, could you imagine driving in one of those? Oh, yeah. That would kill you. So I didn't see any of the cars. I think it had happened a little while before I got there. But I'm hoping everyone's safe. And yeah, I hope so. Gave me an oh shit moment as I'm driving by, like how quickly stuff like that can happen. I know. Every single time I'm on a highway or anywhere behind a big truck, it's total final destination preparedness. Right. (laughs) Always stay back as far as you can. You never know. The other thing is pulling out in front of semis and stuff because they can't stop that no. fast. So you need to be careful around them. I'm always scared when I'm in front of them and things start slowing down because of yes. that. I'm afraid mm-hmm. they won't be able to stop and they're going to hit me and crunch me into another car. It's, yeah. Yeah. I try to avoid semis as much as I can. I wish we didn't have to drive at all. <laughs> <laughs> right. It is probably it's a the, risk every time, really. It's probably the most dangerous thing we do every single day. It is. Yep. Well, I had a bit fun yesterday. Well, I'd say it was an adventure. I went on a walk last night and okay. we came upon this chihuahua, tiny, okay. same color as my chihuahua. So I was worried about it and uh-huh. it didn't it have a like collar out by itself. Right. It was just wandering around and I wasn't able to just leave it because he's tiny. And no. I was like, what the heck? So I'm trying to go up to it. He's obviously scared just barking his little head off but he wasn't running away so I'm like okay this is someone's dog right he's probably really sweet but he's scared like I got to a point where I could put my arm up to him and he snipped it for a second but he was still just barking his head off Mm -hmm. and I was kind of far away from my place at that point I didn't have anything that I could grab him with I didn't want to be bitten or anything so I walked home real real fast (laughs) in flip-flops which was annoying because I think I stepped in water at one point so my feet are like slipping and sliding and the flip-flops were not very thick so I stepped on some rocks and I'm like ow (laughs) but you're like trying to save this puppy (laughs) gotta save him so I get home and I get a cage I get you know some rope and some other things I even grabbed a hot dog like I was just (laughs) trying to find some way to pick up this dog and as I'm coming back he's walking with the dog following the dog the whole time he's barking and stopping and finally he goes up to this front door and I'm like oh that's perfect because that used to be how I would get my dog if she ran away if she ran up to a door then you could like corner them off right so I was happy about that but then someone opened the door and it was their dog oh (laughs) and I was thankful for that because along this adventure he had stopped to poop he ate his own poop he was peeing on everything (laughs) and I'm like I don't know if I want that dog in my place (laughs) right now yeah you're like you know a big commitment I'm just glad we were able to get it home but it was It was a fun adventure. Yeah, you always want to help when you see something like that. I remember when I first moved into my neighborhood, there was a tiny little white fluffy dog, like one of those little Maltese. And I I was just walking out to my mailbox and she was kind of wandering around. And I was like, she has to be a neighbor's. And she was super sweet. I picked her up and then I started texting the neighbors I did know. And one of them was finally like, oh, it's so-and-so's dog. She's blind. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. And it was me and one of my kids that was there. And I'm so glad we picked her up I don't know how she got out and we found the owners knocked on the door and I was like I hear this is your dog and they were just like oh my god we had no idea she was even out she must have gotten you know under the fence or something but she was a little old blind how scary tiny little dog I wonder what she thought I don't know she was so sweet did she even know that she wasn't (laughs) home (laughs) I don't know (laughs) she just had some strange lady pick her up because I picked her up and held her because I didn't know what to do with her and then they said she was blind and I was like oh my god she could have ended up on the busy street yeah all these horrible things so yeah. sometimes it's like those things are meant to happen because yeah. 
you know, the right person comes along to take care of them. Yeah, it's not like we picked him up, but I think following him around led him back home. Yeah. Versus maybe he would have just gone into wandering. where like the coyotes are because oh we weren't goodness. far yeah. from, you know, just fields and stuff. Yeah. I think it was for a reason. I wasted a hot dog on him, though. So. <laughs> he appreciated it. Well, I'm he sure. didn't eat the hot dog, though, because oh, I just had took it, it out <laughs> right before we got to the house. So I threw it down this bank where I actually know some rats live. So I'm sure they appreciated Some it. Somebody <laughs> ate that hot dog. Don't you worry. <laughs> it was funny. <laughs> so what are we talking about today? Today we are talking about the absolutely, unbelievably horrifying story of Alison Bota. Okay. A woman in her late 20s, just living life, when two disgusting, soulless men chose her randomly to be their victim. <sighs> This is a story of survival, though. Okay. Sheer will, miracles, angels, whatever you want to call it. She survived. Mm -hmm. And when you hear about what she endured, it is impossible to imagine anyone surviving. Okay. But she did. The will to live is strong. Yep. So there's a happy ending to this story, but there's also something that's going to make your blood boil at the end. Mm. But you're going to have to wait on that. I first heard about this case in 2016 when the documentary Allison came out. Okay. Came out on Prime, I believe. It was impactful because the production of it was different from most true crime documentaries. Mm -hmm. Typically, we are talking about a life lost. Right. Not a survivor. It was hosted and narrated by Allison herself. That's cool. Hearing her talk about what she went through, telling her own story, although horrific and tragic, her presence made it feel heartwarming and hopeful. She survived this unthinkable thing. And in the end, you know, she's just this super amazing woman. She used her experience to spread awareness and help other women. She's truly an inspiration to a lot of people. But as we have to do in all of the cases that we cover, let's set the scene and see what led to this insane crime. Okay. This case takes place in Port Elizabeth, South Africa. Today, the area is known as, all right, I'm going to try this, Neberha. I practiced and I can't get the click right, but it sounds like the click and when the word is starting is all at the same time. Oh, okay. The dialect that yeah. it's, us little it's white layered. girls can't do. <laughs> <laughs> I tried, but I can't get it. I'm not skilled enough. But this is a new change. It actually happened in 2021. In reading comments about this name change, I saw someone comment, nobody calls it that. It's spelled blah, 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 but it's pronounced Port Elizabeth. <laughs> okay. <laughs> So we're going to stick to that. But the purpose of renaming the city is important. It was to distance itself from its colonial past. Good for them. That's how it should be. But to people who live there, Port Elizabeth is Port Elizabeth. It's not yeah. going to just change overnight. It's a major seaport and the most populous city in Eastern Cape province of South Africa. As we know, South Africa is beautiful. I looked into this particular place and I would actually love to visit it someday. It has beautiful, clean beaches. Right. It's near an elephant national park. I'm there. Which is cool. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Lots of amazing food. But something horrible happened here in December of 1994. Every woman's worst nightmare. Mm. And I'm going to do something a little different here and first talk about the monsters in this story so I don't have to later so that when we get to them, you already know the type of people we are dealing with. OK, we're always uncovering monsters on here. Ugh, they're everywhere. The first is Adrian Franz de Toy. He went by Franz. He was born July 6, 1968. He grew up in Aliwal North, South Africa. I don't have much on his childhood growing up other than that he grew up in a very religious household. Okay. They were Christian. It was as a teenager that he started to rebel. Typical, but he really fell into the wrong crowd and started doing drugs at the age of 13. In school, he was known to be pretty lazy. He didn't make any effort. If he got a bad grade on something, he would make a show of it in class. He was proud of it. Oh, my God. That was Kenneth McDuff, too. Remember? Oh, yeah, that's right. He was show it to everyone. Yep. He was just always looking for attention. Mm -hmm. At some point, he even set his school on fire. <laughs> OK. <laughs> Which is not promising <laughs> sounding. Of course, he was expelled for that. But his reasoning for it was less than interesting. He blamed it on listening to heavy metal music. Oh, God. <laughs> He is very much the devil made me do it type. Okay. And never takes responsibility. No. No. Although he's still a kid now, technically, or at this time, it's very obvious that he was never really punished for any of his actions. His parents stepped in to get him out of things often. Okay. His father was a cop. <laughs> I won't pretend to know exactly everything that he experienced and their parenting style, but it seemed like he had things pretty good with his parents. He seemed to have come from a reasonably good family. 
I'm assuming his rebellion came from his objection to their faith more than anything and meeting other kids with interests that he was unfamiliar with. That or he was born with a screw loose or hit his head young. We don't know. (laughs) Always a possibility. We never know why some people turn out the way they do. Yep. After he was expelled for setting his high school on fire, his family moved to Port Elizabeth in hopes of a new start for him. Unfortunately, changing cities doesn't change a kid's interest just like that. No. (laughs) And there are bad influences everywhere. He found the crowd he was comfortable with and started to experiment with Satanism. Uh, It's at this point in his life. He reminds me a lot of Sean Sellers, actually. At 14 years old, he met a girl. She was said to be the head witch of a coven. Okay. Not a loving healing witch. It was a coven focused on the dark arts. She was the wicked witch. Mm Mm-hmm. And she claimed to possess supernatural powers. I guess she was known to hold a grudge, too. So if you did her wrong, she would curse you. I'm just picturing the main girl from The Craft. Oh, yeah. I can only think of the actress's name, Feruza Bulk, I think. But she wanted to curse her. Yeah, yeah, that's That's who I I see right now. And Franz really liked her because apparently he witnessed these curses or spells come true. Okay. So he believed her. So she had power in his eyes. Right. While they were dating, she taught him and other spells, dark magic, and satanic rituals. Franz claims to have been possessed by the devil twice around this time. Okay. So moving to Port Elizabeth didn't have the effect his parents wanted for him. Quite the opposite, (laughs) I think. Yes, I think so. He failed two grades before dropping out of school. They blamed his bad behavior on her and forbade him from seeing her. In response, once he was 18 to get away, he joined the army. Some say his parents made him go into the army. I don't see how you can make someone go into the army unless it's some sort of agreement, like get your act together or we're cutting you off financially or something. But he was in the army for two years and spent a good portion of his time in detention in the barracks, whatever that means. Time out for army brats. He did not get reformed (laughs) by the army. (laughs) No, he didn't like being told what to do. At 20, once he was out of the army, he got a job as a minor. Shortly after that, he met a girl, got married, and they had a little girl. Okay. He ended up leaving her just a few months after their daughter was born because apparently she did not satisfy him sexually. Fuck off. (laughs) As we'll see, no one can. Mm. His appetite for sex is insatiable. Mm. As far as I know, he never saw his daughter again, which is good because he probably would have started to eye her at some point. Oh, gross. He's one of those. Yeah. After that, he had odd jobs, including a delivery job, which he was fired from for stealing. You know, all this typical stuff. Right. He moved around a bit before deciding to sell alcohol illegally to make money. Other than that, whenever he needed something, he just went back to his parents and got money from them. So they enabled him. Yeah. In 1993, he married for a second time. And all this time, he's still involved in Satanism and performing rituals. Okay. When she got pregnant, he said he performed a ritual asking the devil to have his son born on his birthday. Okay. And he was. And it was. So take what you want from that. But it convinced Franz that he had serious powers. (laughs) I mean, that is pretty weird. It is to weird. have a child born on your birthday. He even claimed to have telekinetic powers, although I'm pretty sure that he never demonstrated this for anyone. Okay. Did he use these supposed powers for good things? Never. Of course not. <laughs> but he wouldn't shut up about it, and younger, more vulnerable boys fell victim to his claims and would follow him. Mm. Ultimately, Franz was just a spoiled, good for nothing asshole who got bailed out by his parents when he did bad things. He thought he was above everything. Yeah, that's not setting your child up for success in any way. Nope. The second scum of the earth is Tien's Claire. I'm not going to say that again. It's spelt like Kruger. Okay. And that's my attempt. He was born in 1975. He grew up in Port Elizabeth. His childhood was not pleasant. His father was a criminal and a drug addict and left his mother before Tian's was born. And somehow she met someone else and got married before he was born. That's quick. <laughs> but that didn't last long. She divorced him and married again by the time Tian's was just nine months old. Damn, girl. I know. Talk about jumping around. Clearly, his mother had her own issues that she was dealing with. So his life was unstable from the moment he was conceived, really. Mm -hmm. The third man, according to Tian's, was not a good man. Not saying the other two were good. I don't know anything about them. But he claims that his stepfather was violently abusive, often leaving Tian's black and blue. Ouch. He claimed to also have been sexually abused by his stepfather from a young age. I believe it. Now, his stepfather, of course, denies all of this. I believe he even threatens to sue people who repeat this. So 
Sorry. Are we going to get sued? <laughs> I don't know. I'm saying allegedly. You can't yeah, sue me exactly. for that. Many do believe that Tian's made this up to get sympathy during trial. I have no idea what the truth is, but with what we know... It probably happened. Seriously. <laughs> Especially a man who wants to marry a woman with a young child that quick. Yeah. They, and knowing that yeah. she was married twice before. A lot in a of matter times, of like a yeah. year and a half. Men look for that kind of situation if they want to abuse well, children. Well, it's power, mm-hmm. right? Tian's also said the only person he really liked was his aunt because she didn't hurt him and she fed him, which oh. speaks volumes to me. That means that everywhere else in his life wasn't safe. For he him. never got he had food instability. And yeah, it's not much to ask for. That's like the bare minimum that you do for a child. Food. Don't hurt. Me. Don't beat them. <laughs> yeah. Like, so I'm thinking some, if not all of what he claimed was true, at least of his childhood and his mom, although she thought that they were close when he was a kid, she admitted to not really being around for him and not trying to connect with him in his teenage years so was she like addicted or something I think she was a drug user I think she also just some people aren't really meant to be parents and I think that's probably the case here yeah Tian's attempted suicide more than once in his younger years all in all if it all happened no child should have to experience what he did if it's true but it's the same argument we always have not everyone who goes through similar experiences ends up becoming a monster true but it didn't help that he was also bullied in school Somehow his peers found out that he was born with a third nipple. Okay. This was something that he had removed later in life, but it was enough to make his life a living hell. You know, they had a lot of names for him. Yeah, kids can be really mean. He tried running away several times and ended up dropping out of school at the age of 15. He turned to drugs and alcohol like Franz. He even joined the army like Franz as soon as he could to get away from his life at home. Okay. But he was not in the army for very long at all, less than a year. After he dropped out, also like Franz, he met a satanic witch and had a very intense relationship with her before she left him. It didn't happen to be the same girl. That's what <laughs> I'm wondering. I'm like, this is just one town. There can't be right? that many satanic witches. I don't know. But before she left him, she introduced him to the dark arts and started to teach him satanic rituals. Okay. I guess, you know, in this group that he was friends with different people, he did have some nicknames around this time, which included Damien and Chucky. So that's what people saw him as. So he already okay. had a reputation of being evil or being evil and not giving a fuck after this tians couldn't get anyone to sleep with him (laughs) girls did not like him okay obviously this was a continuation more than likely anyway from his earlier teenage years and he just became extremely sexually frustrated so this is the beginning of his incel incels are dangerous yep he thought girls should just give it to him, mm-hmm. but no one wanted to. He's one of those men. Yep. He didn't think that he should have to court anyone in any way. And this is when 19-year-old Tans met 26-year-old Franz in June of 1994. Okay. How these two came together makes me question the universe sometimes. Right. Why? Why did you take these two men that were already kind of evil? I, I don't want to say they're evil yet, but I mean they're, they're getting developing there. that way. Correct. And they're both sexually deviant in yeah. some way. Yep. They became quick friends. They had so much in common despite their age difference. But because of the age difference, I believe Tians was heavily influenced by Franz. Yes, obviously. Franz told him that he had been possessed by the devil more than once, and Tians believed him. He looked up to Franz. Tians was like, I want to be possessed. Yeah, I mean, he's (laughs) very troubled and lonely, and, you know, Franz became this home for him. Mm -hmm. Tians had really low self-image, and this devil worship stuff they connected on gave him a sense of purpose. It was the closest thing to power that right. he could find, even if it was make-believe. Mm-hmm. He wanted to be dominant, and Franz was more than happy to show him his sick delusional ways, Okay, and they would go off to do horrific things together. Not long after they met, Franz raped a woman. I'm sure he did before. Yeah, He's that was the first time. He's 26 at this point. Okay. Yeah. But this woman went to the police. Tians wasn't involved with this, but I have no doubt he bragged about it to Tians to convince him to do it with him. Of course he did. I do not have her name, but one night a 20-year-old student was sitting in her car outside of a pizza place in Port Elizabeth. He forced his way into her car with a gun and drove her to a secluded area and raped her. He then proceeded to force her to have dinner with him at a restaurant and gave her a rose. Oh, my God. (laughs) After that, he drove her somewhere else and raped her again, forcing her to tell him that she loved him during it. So he needed this fantasy. It's all fantasy stuff. Mm -hmm. It's fucked up. After threatening to kill her if she went to the cops, he dropped her off in the city. He then told her that she was an amazing person and, quote, I hope I can make this up to you sometime. And then he stole her car. Oh, my God. (laughs) 
It took her a week to go to the police, but she did. I mean, I don't blame her. This story is, it's crazy. It's wild, right? And he said he was going to kill you. Like, yeah. you would doubt yourself on if you should turn him in. But I mean, this whole weird date in the middle of it, too. Like, how do you explain that? But it's just proof of how fucking insane Franz is. He thinks he can get away with anything and right. take whatever he wants. He was arrested for this, but he was released. <sighs> In the end, they said that there was no evidence to support her claims. <laughs> There's never enough evidence when it comes to rape. Nope. Minnie believed Fran's dad got involved to have it squashed. Oh, yeah. He's Mr. Cop Man. Yeah. It's not a good look for your son to be a convicted rapist. Right. It's all about him, I'm sure. On December 4th, together, Franz and Tians took it up a notch. That night, they came upon a 21-year-old woman who was walking alone. They ambushed her, threatened her with a gun, and forced her behind some tall bushes. Tians raped her first. Then Franz forced her to perform oral sex on him. But she gagged and it pissed him off. Then he raped her. And while they were raping her, she begged them to stop because this poor girl was pregnant. Oh, no. They didn't care. After they finished, they stood over her and discussed whether or not they should kill her. Oh, my God. I can't imagine. How scary. Well, this and poor then you're, woman. You're pregnant. You're worried about your unborn child. Yeah. Thankfully, they ended up letting her go. And this time, she did not wait. She went straight to the cops after the assault. Yeah. They were arrested. But after being interviewed, they were released on bail. Ugh, makes me so mad. They were due back to court on January 5th. Mm hmm. Franz had already been arrested for rape just a few months before this, and he was allowed out on bail the second time. It's infuriating. So they should have been held to the court date. Yes, they're obviously a danger to society. Yep. And if they were, they wouldn't have been able to do what they did next. So they're going to go after Allison during their time while they're out on bail. That's fucked. It makes me so angry that the way that we treat rapists, I feel like it's seen as like a petty crime. Like you could just go into a 7-Eleven and steal like a loaf of bread or something and get the same sentence as you would raping a woman, changing her entire fucking life where she's afraid to do anything ever again. And just it's been going on since the dawn of time. And it, it sounds like it's in every country in the fucking world because this isn't even America. I know. Well, what's scary to me about this is, yeah, it's not taken seriously. But the next step for these people, and it always ends up this way, is violence. Yeah, they always start so with rape. you can't rape. let them mm-hmm. go. They end up killing somebody at it's some point. It's not just sex. Right. Their next step is going to be killing because the girls before... Tell on them. Tell on them. And they think, all right, well, now I we have can't to let them, them go. Mm-hmm. And also, any person who is already like got the proclivity towards rape, they have to keep getting something more exciting each time. Right. We've seen this in every single case we ever talk about. Almost every serial killer starts with just rape. They always have to step it up. Mm -hmm. It's got to get more exciting for them sexually. Because it's impossible to keep them happy. Mm -hmm. It's insatiable, right? Right. The whole point is that they're never actually reaching the high that they want. They're dangerous. And we do nothing towards rapists. No. And the women who come forward are prosecuted more than the rapist ever will be. So fucked up. So now we're back to Allison. Allison was born September 22nd, 1967 in Port Elizabeth, which means she's a Virgo. Okay. Like my mama. And hearing her talk and just the way she thinks about life, I'm like, wow, that's totally my mom. <laughs> I like look up to Virgos. They've got their shit together. They Every do, Virgo but I've known. It's, it's an earth sign as well. They remind right. me a lot of myself because there's so much pressure put on the shoulders of Virgo. Yes. To keep it together. True. To be the one that's always there to take care of everyone around them. Mm-hmm. And that's exactly how my mom is. I really connect to Virgos. I'm an air sign, so nobody expects anything from us. <laughs> well, you're my rising sign, so I have a lot of conflict within myself on a daily basis. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> anyway. She lived with both of her parents, Brian and Claire Botha, until they divorced when Allison was 10. After that, she lived with her mother, but her father was very much a part of her life. Her parents were always very supportive of her. She definitely grew up with a lot of love despite, you know, the challenges of a divorce when you're a child. Right. Through it, she became resilient and independent. Her mother and her were very close. Her mother's love and support was always a source of inspiration for Allison, and she'll never put that down. That's sweet. And she also has an older brother by a year and a half. His name's Neil, and they were very close as well. Okay. Growing up, she'll say that she was never quite good at school and didn't really feel a pull toward anything specific that she wanted to do with her life. She had no big dreams. 
but that's just the Virgo side of her. She's always downplaying her importance. And they're also perfectionist as one of their yeah. weaknesses or whatever. So they won't make a decision on what they want to do unless they know that's exactly right. right. Because she loved high school and she was assigned as head girl at the collegiate high school for girls in Port Elizabeth. So, so she mean, was good at school. She was good at it. <laughs> it's sort of like the student body president here. Yeah. She's a perfectionist. So she didn't think she was good enough. Yeah. She was good at it. But typical teenager. Not aware of her awesomeness. Right. <laughs> she graduated in 1985. After high school, she studied for her secretarial degree for a year before deciding to travel. She spent close to four years overseas in London, just living it up before returning home to Port Elizabeth. And her family was really happy to have her home because having your young child be so far away is scary, as you know, yes. currently. I have a child in Japan right now. I know. That's crazy. I don't know how you're doing it. I was. That's <laughs> funny. I had just looked at my phone because it is now 7 a.m. in Japan. And I was like, oh, I should be able to see a message soon. Right. They're going to text me soon. Yes. I really don't know how you're dealing with that. <laughs> <laughs> Lots of pictures. That's good. When she was back, she got a job as an insurance broker. It wasn't a dream job, but she loved her coworkers and she had a lot of fun doing it. Mm -hmm. She didn't expect to do it forever. But at that point, she was very content and happy with her life. So fast forward a couple years later to December 17th, 1994. She's now 27 years old. Okay. It was a perfect summer day in South Africa. It was a Sunday. She spent the entire day at the beach with friends. After that, they all went back to her friend Kim's house for a bit before moving over to Allison's apartment where they ordered pizza. They played a game of balderdash and drank some wine. I love balderdash. <laughs> <laughs> Which makes me want to do another girls night at your yes. place because that's so fun. It I want to do Drinking wine and playing silly games. Yeah. Balderdash is so 1990s too. <laughs> But once everyone was ready to call it quits, Kim, who was also a co-worker of hers, needed a ride home, which Allison had agreed to do when they moved the party over to her place. Mm -hmm. And Allison had also done her laundry over there and needed to pick it up. Okay. So they both got in Allison's yellow Renault 5. This is her car, which she named Reginald, by the way. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> and went back to Kim's. And this was about 1 a.m. Okay. When she got back to her place, someone had parked in the convenient spot that she had before taking Kim home. Okay. So she had to drive further down the road to find a spot. It was street parking. She found a spot under a big tree. The street was dimly lit and the spot had barely any light. No, oh, no. She turned off the engine switched off the lights and reached over to grab her laundry when a man appeared at her door and opened it. Oh no. She didn't see him. She felt the warm night rushing and then a knife at her throat before hearing him say, move over or I'll kill you. Oh my God. Clothing clutched in her arms. She scooted over to the passenger seat while he got into the driver's seat. Her first thought was, you know, crap, I didn't lock the car doors. Yeah. Something we take for granted, I think, nowadays. I try to remember to do it at night myself. I know. If I don't remember. But now I have a car that the moment I start driving, the it car locks. doors yes. lock on their own. So I don't think about it much. But stories like this, you know, you need to because this happened to me when I was a teenager. I don't know if I've told this story on here. And if I have, I'm sorry, but if you're new listening, oh, well, here you go. <laughs> I was 16 or 17 years old at the time. I was working downtown in Albuquerque at this Brazilian steakhouse. And anybody who's from there knows that it. it's Tacanos. Okay. It was night and I was parked on the street right out front and I was mm -hmm. just sitting in my car. It was an older car and my doors were unlocked. It's probably one that had manual locks back in those yeah, days. Manual yep. locks. I can't remember what I was doing, but a woman just climbed into my passenger seat. Whoa. She had a knife. Oh, and my God. I just froze. I had my hands on the wheel and she was just saying random things. I, I don't even remember. She was drugged out, probably. What she was saying. But then a man showed up at the passenger side door and oh she God. got out to let him in the back seat. Oh, my God. And they were threatening me. I don't remember them telling me to drive. Like I blacked out this moment of them being in the car. All I remember is them starting to argue with each other and me thinking, I think they're on drugs. Right. That's when you just get out. I know. And I thought about that. But you freeze. But in you the freeze. Moment. You don't know what you're going to do. She has a knife and she's right. chaotic. Right. And she's just like talking with it. And she could like come at you at any moment. You know, you just you don't know what to do. And I'm thinking people can probably see us. If you know Tacanos and Albuquerque, it's all glass. Okay. And I'm just across the street, like just enough to walk out. Mm -hmm. It's not like I had tinted windows or anything. And I'm right. just hoping that someone can see me. So just to get an idea of where I'm at too, Central Avenue 
Avenue in Albuquerque is like Colfax here. So there are okay. different parts of the street that are pretty dangerous. Yeah. You think of any major mm-hmm. city, I guess. And at some point, this girl just gets really, really frustrated. She starts huffing and puffing. She even slammed her hands like down on the dash and what she is, just yeah. gets out. OK. And she's yelling at him to get out. OK. And they just left, but not before someone putting their head down in my window and saying, you better start locking your doors. So it kind of stuck in my brain. Yeah. (laughs) And even now I'm mad at myself because I forget sometimes and I have a daughter and I shouldn't be doing this. So Mm -hmm. lock your doors. But from this point, I immediately sped away. Right. I am in a panic. I'm crying. Uh, Yeah. I was just trying to get out of there. But within must have been a minute. I was pulled over by a cop. Oh, my God. Because I didn't have my lights on. It was night. Yeah. And I'm clearly distraught. I was a young kid. I was crying. I tried explaining what just happened to me. I even pointed to where they are because they walk down the street. They're not in a car. Right. And he didn't believe me. Fuck off. And he asked if I had anything to drink or if I was on something. And I just, I couldn't believe it. Like the audacity. Right. And I still had a work apron on. Like it's <laughs> obvious I'm not a druggie dude. I'm a teenager. Yeah. They did nothing. So yeah, I have some personal feelings when I say fuck cops because I feel like I've been in several situations where they could have protected me and they chose not no. to. And then they're like, let me write you a ticket instead. Anyway, moral of the story, lock your doors. Back to Allison. He's in the car now. Yeah. She's scared, mm-hmm. but she's not really sure what to think yet. Her door was unlocked. She could have jumped out. Yeah. I mean, he did immediately start driving, but she could have jumped out. We can't pretend to know what she was feeling in that moment. No, you freeze. He had a knife. He had a big knife. You're assessing the situation. It takes time. And in Allison's case, she was hopeful that it wouldn't turn out bad. She had a very optimistic view of life. Okay. He told her that he didn't want to hurt her and that he just needed to use her car okay. for about an hour. Okay. But he also confirmed that he might have been watching her a little bit because he asked a question like, you live in number one, right? Oh, that's creepy. So either he'd been watching her for a while or he at least saw her and Kim leaving earlier. Oh. So she was chosen, okay. whether it was before this night or that night, no one knows. But this was Franz de Toy. Mm-hmm. Although he lied, he told her that his name was Clinton. Okay. And she also lied and said that her name was Susan. <laughs> he asked her if she lived alone. She lied again and said, no, my boyfriend's home waiting for me. She offered to let him have the car, you know, just have it. I'll go home. All's good. You right. Know? He said no, that he wanted the company. Okay. As they were driving, they chit chatted a bit. She wanted to learn more about him. And most of all, she didn't want to show him that she was afraid. Right. Their interaction gave her this false sense of security, even though he refused to say anything about himself. Okay. Maybe he really did just need to use the car. Mm-hmm. And he would take me back home. You hope that's the case, but. <laughs> yes. He said a friend stole his TV and owed him money and that that's who they were going to find because he needed the money. Okay. She was trying to stay positive. She admits that she was being a bit delusional about it. Mm -hmm. He seemed kind of normal, just like any other guy in the area. So she was trying. (laughs) Yeah. Maybe he really did just need the car, like you said. Yeah. That was until he stopped the car in front of a club. There were tons of people outside, cabs. She could have just jumped out then, but she had this uneasy feeling about it. She remembers like, this isn't my scene. She said it felt eerie, like it made her feel like everyone around were his people. Okay. And that they would just all get her in that moment. Like they weren't going to help. She was panicking and she just kept thinking back to the big knife that he had just resting right there by his thigh. Mm -hmm. He was scanning the crowd and said, where the fuck is he? He drove around some more. He was growing really annoyed and frustrated, going up and down the street until he went to the other side. And she was starting to worry that he was going to take it out on her. Yeah. This lasted for a while until Franz and the other guy spotted each other. He parked and let Tians get in the back seat. Okay. Clinton, a.k.a. Franz, even introduced him as Tians. Which I think is interesting. Why did, yeah, he uses a code name, but not for him. I think they're just not thinking clearly at all. Franz even asked Tians for a cigarette and Allison asked for one too. Anything to calm her nerves. Yeah. It was after Tians got into the car that she really got scared. She locked eyes with him in the rearview mirror and all she saw was dead, cold, evil. Oh no. For the first time, she didn't think that she would be going home. Oh my God. I can't imagine that feeling like that sinking yeah, realization. Yeah, she's like, this isn't about my car. This they is have about plans. Me. Yeah. Now remember, these two are out on bail for raping a pregnant woman. Right. They're due to court soon. They shouldn't even be out. That's no, just, they should have never, ever, ever been let out. That's just something that I keep reminding myself of 
during this whole next How many bit. times do we say this on the podcast? If they had just kept them in prison, yes. so many women would be alive yep. like across multiple episodes now. I know. I, you don't even know what to say anymore. Yeah. It's just the way our world works. Yeah. So they drove out of town past every place she knew, mm. places she didn't oh until God. they were in the dark, no streetlights, out of the city and alone. Franz stopped in an alcove on this sandy dirt road out in the middle of nowhere off an entrance to the beach. No lights, no other cars, just the three of them. She knew that something very bad was about to happen. Yeah. Tians got out of the car and started smoking a cigarette. Allison, frightened, turned to Franz and said, what now? Yeah, like... And he gave Allison this puzzled look and said, but I thought you would have realized we want sex. Okay. She was quiet. And then that's when he said, are you going to fight? <laughs> oh, my God. Her brain is racing. Of course she wanted to fight. Right. But she doubted her ability. There were two of them. Mm -hmm. She said no. And that's when he forced her to take off her clothes and perform oral sex on him. He didn't ask nicely, of course. And he told her if she bit him, he'd kill her. She did resist some, and in response, he would just force her head down further. Uh -huh. After that, he forcibly went down on her. And what's really disgusting during it all, he's asking her questions like, do you like it? Of course, because he, he wants to live that fantasy. Does your boyfriend do this to you? Mm -hmm. He even said shit like, you have the nicest tasting fanny. After that, he bit her on her breast, kissed her, and then he raped her. She tried to distance herself from it all, as any what a, woman yeah, does you have in this to situation. Reminded herself over and over again that he was doing this to her body, not her. Yeah. He wasn't going to get to her mind. Mm -hmm. She zoned out as best she could, but then her body betrayed her. It responded to what he was doing. Oh, shit. She couldn't understand why. She was disgusted by him, literally, right. in every way. She was being violated, which was horrifying. Like, this whole time, it's happening. Like, why? But, you know, right. it's the same thing as a man. Yeah. That dick can't. is not related to what's actually going on in your in your head sometimes. Right. In a woman, you know, same thing with the clit, it can, unfortunately. Yeah. It's a wild thing to yeah. think about because even women who love the person that they're doing stuff can't. with sometimes, sometimes can't get yeah. off or get wet or anything like that. So, you know, I'm sure she had to go through therapy to realize why that part of this happened. Yeah, that would be really, really yeah. hard to deal with. And this whole time, Tians is staring through the window watching it all happen. A little creeper. Franz finished up, pulled up his pants and yelled to Tians. He got out and asked Tians, do you want to have sex with this lovely lady? Tians coldly said, no, I want to fuck that bitch. <laughs> okay. Franz got upset with Tians and said, no, you can't talk to her like that. She's a lady and you must speak properly to her. What the fuck? <laughs> Listen, I was listening to other people talk about their theories when it comes to Franz. Some think he was weirdly trying to protect her. I don't think that for one second. No. He forced her to do horrible things and raped her and right. told her that he was going to kill her. I think he was just being a fucking asshole. You know, yeah. It was comical, adding salt to the wound type right. of thing. Other people do go further, though, into the type of rapist that Franz is. Right. I guess he's been categorized as a gentleman rapist. He thinks it's romantic in some way. Right. It's another name for it is power reassurance rapist. They say it's actually the most common type of rapist. It's all about this fantasy that, that the rapist constructs that his victims sexually desire them. Yes. And that and during rapists, the act, yeah. they're enjoying it. Right. Which, you know, didn't help. That she yeah. responded because, yes. It's like the same kind of guys that believe sex workers enjoy. <laughs> right. What they're doing. Them. Right. Like, they're I like, know. oh, yeah, she doesn't usually like men mm -hmm. like this. But me, she does. Like, they can trick themselves. Yeah. So these type of rapists, they'll often instruct the victim to do something during the attack, like say something. Mm -hmm. They're usually complimentary to the victim. And they don't force or threaten them too much. Right. After the assault, they might share personal information about themselves or try to arrange another time for this consensual right. sexual encounter. It does seem to match him when we consider, especially what he did with the first woman that we heard about. Yeah, the date thing definitely fits that but profile. But this is not a one size fits all. No. And he takes this to a whole new level very quickly. Right. So I don't like categorizing him this way. He's his own level. Of yeah, that's up. almost like giving him. Um, sympathy in a way and no. no no you don't get to be titled and it be a gentleman no you're excused away you're nowhere near a gentleman so that shouldn't be put anywhere in my mind gentlemen and rapists should no. never be next to each no, other no, no, so no, no, no. No. let's not do that anyway franz moved to the passenger seat so he could watch tian's tian's got in the car 
He wasn't really hard enough, but he did his best to try and rape her before stopping and saying that he couldn't do it. Okay. He got out of the car frustrated and slammed the door. That sucks because now he's angry and embarrassed. Yep. Fuck. That's a bad case for her. Yep. See, this whole time she was really scared of Tian's compared to Franz. Okay. But they're equally to be scared of. Mm. She was left in the car with Franz, who was almost nodding off, acting like he was like tired and sleeping. (laughs) So she asked if she could get dressed and he didn't answer her. Okay. So Allison started reaching around the floor to find her clothes. Mm -hmm. And that's when she heard Tian's yell from outside the car, Franz. And this was the first time that she heard his real name. Oh, It wasn't Clinton. Clinton, yeah. She immediately memorized it. Franz and Tian's. Right. She didn't know if Tian's was his real name, but Franz used it more than once, so she thought it was. Mm -hmm. She had already spent her time with them memorizing their physical features, and now she knew their names. Good. The two started to talk about what they should do with her. In front of her? Yes. She promised she wouldn't go to the police, of course. They said that they didn't believe her. She remembers Franz asking... What would Omnic want us to do with her? Is Omnic a demon or something? I think it means the devil. Okay. Tian's responded saying, well, he would want us to kill her. Now, some of this is being said in the Afrikaans language. Okay. So it's a little bit back and forth. Does she know that language or no? Yes. Okay. Which I think a lot of people in the area do. Mm -hmm. And I think the reason why Tian's used it more is he was not as much of an English speaker. Okay. So even though she knew they were both carrying knives, because she actually saw Tian's also had a knife on his body when he was out walking around the car. Mm, She saw it. She actually, at this point, still did not think that they were going to hurt her. She thought they were really fucked up and they wanted to have sex with her, but okay. but she didn't think that they were actually going to hurt her. Yeah. She didn't want to believe it. You know, no. her brain is telling her, how like, can someone be this messed up? It's a defense mechanism. She thought that they were bluffing and that they wanted her to beg for her life. You know, she understood this was a power thing. Right. So maybe that's what they needed. By this time, she was dressed and then Franz ordered her to take off all of her clothes again. Oh, no. She thought that meant that they were going to rape her again Mm -hmm. and leave her there naked because they had joked about leaving her there naked. And she thought to herself, well, fine, you know, I would rather be naked (laughs) if that means you leave me alone. Right. But this time he took her jewelry too, her rings. Franz let Tian's back into the back seat again. For a moment, Allison thought it was finally all over. But before she knew it, in a split second, Franz had lunged on top of her and was strangling her. Oh, my God. She asked once, please don't kill me. Mm -hmm. And all he said was, sorry. (sighs) He was choking her so hard that he actually crushed her windpipe. Oh, my God. And before she lost consciousness, her bowels relieved themselves. Yeah. She woke up naked outside of the car on the sand. And this is sand mixed with a layer of black ash, trash, and broken glass underneath and all around her. They pulled her body out of the car near the bushes. She didn't understand what had happened, but she knew whatever it was, it was bad. Mm -hmm. Then she realized that she was hearing something strange and tried to focus her eyes. When she did, she saw someone knelt over her and his arm was moving back and forth. She realized then that he was slashing her neck. Oh, no. It was Tian's. She heard her flesh slicing open. It was a surreal moment for her, clearly, not only because of the realization that he's trying to kill her, but also because she couldn't feel it. Why? I wonder. She was she paralyzed felt nothing, or something? No pain. I think she was being protected by something. We can't explain. Right. Then Franz pushed Tian's out of the way and took over, slicing her throat. She said his head was right in the middle of the moonlight. Mm-hmm. She just remembers it looking like he had a halo, okay. which is really fucked up in this moment. Mm-hmm. And also the fact that she was awake and experiencing this. And not just awake, but completely lucid. Wow. She was amazed at how sharp her mind was at that moment. Watching this, yeah. Just in case you decide to watch the documentary I mentioned, a little forewarning. Part of this was recreated and they did a really good job. So really disturbing. It's pretty realistic and surprisingly brutal. Yeah. The actor doing this slashing was believable. Okay. It took you there to the moment, like what that scene was like. Just this absolute disregard for a human being. So it's uncomfortable to watch. Just letting you know. When Fran stopped and walked away, she moved onto her side. She curled up. She regretted it, though, because she was worried that they saw that and they saw her and would come back to finish her. But they didn't. Okay, she could hear them talking in the distance. She could also hear this sick, grumbling, bubbling gurgle. There was a few leaves in front of her body and they were moving with this grumble. 
when she realized that the noise was coming from her slashed throat. It was her breathing. She tried to hold her breath, but it didn't work. Mm -hmm. Her body was breathing regardless and coming through her neck. She tried to cover her neck and her hand went into oh. her very large neck wound. Oh, my God. So she used her whole hand to try and cover the sound and it worked. She needed them to think that she was dead. Right. She could still hear them talking, although very faint. She did hear one say, do you think she's dead? Mm -hmm. And the other one respond, no one can survive that. Okay. Turned away from them, not moving and playing dead. She felt something land on her or near her, something somewhat soft. She didn't budge, and then she heard them get in the car, turn on the engine, and drive off. Okay. She laid there for a while, waiting. Yeah. And then she she let it all hit her. Mm -hmm. I'm dying. Yeah. I don't want to die. I can't die like this, out here naked, in the trash, in this ash. Yeah. She sat with that for some time, actually. She said she was, it was just very, very sad. She was very sad. Mm -hmm. But then she decided, you know, I need to do something. So she lifted one of her arms. She reached out and in the sand, she wrote their names. Oh, wow. So that they could. That yep. was smart. Franz and Tans. And under that, she wrote, and this gets me big time. I think I cried every time I heard this from someone. She wrote, I love mom. Aww. You know, if she died there, not only would they know who did it, mm -hmm. her mom would know that she thought of her in, in her last, last moments. Yeah. And this is when Allison says that she left her body. Okay. She remembers leaving. And looking down on herself, mm -hmm. all the noise stopped. Yeah. Everything was completely silent. She remembers knowing that she had the option to go back. It could stop now or she could go back and live and try and live life better. She wasn't too far from her body. It wasn't. It wasn't like a true near death. It was, though, because for her, it was a moment of choice. She knew it was a choice. Yeah. And she's she, out of her body. She had this second chance. It was a very spiritual moment for her. There was no booming voice. There was no lights, but she felt that something was with her. She remembers this. She wasn't alone. Yeah. And she was being asked if she wanted to go back. No voice, but she knew that that something was the question was. Okay. asking her. Hovering up there, she ended up seeing lights out of the corner of her eye. Not the lights, but lights. She saw lights and she recognized them as car lights oh, in the like distance. Oh, like headlights. Okay. Yeah. And that was enough to convince her. So she decided, yes, I want to go back. Okay. It was tempting to surrender to the peace, but she wasn't done yet. So she went back and once again, she heard the grumbling, gurgling of her throat. Mm -hmm. And she hated this sound. Yeah. It disgusted her. But what does she do now? As she laid there, she tried to get up on her hands and knees. And as she did, she felt something wet between her legs. Okay. Again, she felt no pain. So she's not really I'm, aware of... I'm so glad she did it. I know. Huge, huge deal. I'm very thankful for that. She felt down toward her abdomen. Oh, no. And realized it was her intestines. <gasps> like coming out? There was a gaping hole in her lower abdomen and her intestines were outside of her body. Oh, my God. She tried to scoop them up and put them back in, but they just slithered out of her hands. Oh, my God. It was oh too God. much... She couldn't get it all. And she just remembers that there was just so much of it. It was incredible. She knew she couldn't crawl, dragging them on the ground. So she patted around her and eventually found something soft. It was her denim shirt that they okay. had thrown out of the car. So she gathered all she could into the shirt and tried her best to stuff it all inside her stomach, shirt and all. Oh, my God. It felt very foreign and heavy, but, you know, it would have to do. She knew that her neck was another issue, but... She could tell it didn't feel right, the stability of it, but she couldn't focus on that yet. Okay. With one hand on her stomach, holding in her intestines, she used the other hand and her knees and started to crawl. Okay, wow. What was once pure darkness was now lit up for her, thanks to a full moon that night. Okay. Her knees and hands were being scraped and cut up by glass. Yeah. She could clearly see the black ash that was mixed throughout from years of partying on this beach. She tried for what felt like forever, but she didn't get very far. She collapsed on some rocks. She knew what she was trying to do with crawling. She didn't have enough energy for. Right. She thought about surrendering again. She knew the other side, whatever you want to call it. You know, whatever comes immediately after death. It was peaceful. She felt part That's of that. good to hear. But she pushed on in her own mind, having a conversation with herself. She gave herself a pep talk. You know, she advocated for herself. Yeah. She loved her life. She liked who she was, and there were important things that she needed to do. Mm -hmm. And she thought of her mom. She was worried that if they found her right there, 
where she had gotten to, her mom would know that she tried and actually struggled in her last moment. And it'd be devastating for her mom. Yeah, and she did not want to do that to her. So Allison knew she needed to get to the road faster, which meant she needed to walk. Oh my God. With every bit of strength she had left in her, she got to her feet. But just as soon as she did, everything went black. Yeah. She didn't pass out. She just couldn't see. It took a few moments to realize that her head was not where it was supposed to be. Oh, God. It had fallen back and was laying between her shoulder blades. Oh, my God. She was staring at the night sky. Amazingly, she kept her cool. I don't know how you keep your cool realizing that your head is on a hinge in this (sighs) way, but she reached back, she grabbed her head, and brought it forward. That is insane. It took a few moments as she was in and out of passing out. Yeah. But once she could see forward again, she tried to cover her neck, cover the gurgling and the bleeding, and was caught off guard again when her whole hand disappeared into her neck. Ugh. She could feel everything. She said, Oh my God. Everything. I she, would pass out just at the thought of it. I know. She took her hand out and covered it as best she could and started plodding along. It wasn't long though before she fell and had to get back up again. At some point, her sandals had come off her feet and were still connected at the ankle. And it was really bothering her. Yeah. You know, I I totally get it. So there were these like brown leather sandals, right? Yeah. They're just connected at her ankle. And she's trying everything she can to walk. Yeah. I can see why something that annoying is going to bother you so much when you're already holding your your life. Well, you're already (laughs) holding your head and your and your intestines. But it was making it harder to walk. So she made the decision to stop. She took her hand off her neck and quickly as she could unbuckled the sandals and left them there. But she was dizzy after and she fell again. She remembers blacking out and falling several times, but somehow getting back up. And at times, even with no vision, she knew that she was walking. And when vision would come back for a second, she could see her feet moving, but she couldn't feel herself doing it. Yeah. Looking back, she has no idea how she did it. I don't either. Listening to this. I know. How does your body even function? She believes it was divine intervention. Yes. That something or someone got in her body and did it for her, really. Mm -hmm. Used her body to get her to where she needed to be because suddenly she made it. She made it to the road. And she just collapsed right in the middle of the road. Okay. She thought, you know what? There's a good chance someone speeding down this road is going to hit me. Right. And she thought, oh, well, you know, I've already been through so much. You know, at least maybe it'll finally put me out of my misery. Mm -hmm. But she knew if she had been off to the side of the road, they'd They'd miss miss her. her. Mm -hmm. So there she was laying in the middle of the road. She had nothing left in her. She had no energy whatsoever. Yeah. And all she could do was wait. She heard a car and she saw the lights approaching. And at this point, she can't move her head anymore at all. She's lost it's, all. It's yeah. kind of off to the side. And whatever she can see is just right where her eyesight is. Otherwise, right. she's using her other senses right now. She could see lights kind of approaching. And at first she realized, oh, fuck. What if it's them? What if they're coming back oh, to see fuck. if I'm dead? This car stopped and idled for a long time. She said it felt like 10, 15 minutes of them just sitting there. They were probably trying to like understand what they were seeing. Yeah. Yeah. They did end up leaving, going around her and speeding away. What? She saw that it was a Volkswagen Beetle. It was just someone who was not prepared to deal with what they saw. And they were like debating it. Because she was quite the sight. Okay. I mean, her head's hanging off. They're probably like trying to decide if she was alive or not. Yeah. Bloody, not moving. They didn't want to get involved. I don't know. Yeah. She was defeated. She wasn't mad at whoever drove off. She didn't know their reasoning. Maybe they were scared or they thought it was an ambush. Yeah. She wasn't mad, but she was really sad. Like, what if that was going to be the only car? Right. After everything she did to get to the road. This time, like, she started to feel it. She could feel herself dying, slipping away. And mm-hmm. she knew she didn't have much time. Right. But then another car came. They stopped too, but this time got out and rushed to her. Yeah. The first person she saw was a woman. She stood over Allison, taking it all in before screaming. Yeah, I can't imagine seeing that. Allison said all she could think at that moment was get her away from me. Like, Mm -hmm. I can't deal with this right now. I understand I'm a horrible sight, but screaming is not helping me. Then she heard more people standing around her. You know, she couldn't move. And all she could see was what was right in front of her. And after a few moments, a man's face appeared. Okay. He got on the ground with her at eye level Mm -hmm. and took her hand. And she knew immediately that he was going to help her. And she was relieved. This was Tian Eilard. 
Tian sounds really similar to Tian's, but not. But he's a better man, obviously. Right. In every way. In every way. One is a good person. One is a very, very bad person. Tian was in Port Elizabeth on holiday with friends. They were from Hauteng, which is about 670 miles away. So, Oh, wow. Quite a journey there. They had just come from a nightclub. There were eight of them in two cars. Mm -hmm. He was behind the first car with the girl who first ran to Allison and screamed. Yeah. That same girl ran to their car to tell them why they screeched to a halt. Right. When Tion got to her, he took in all her wounds. Mm -hmm. He was a vet tech student. Oh, that's good. He was no human doctor, but that didn't mean he didn't know a thing or two. He's probably seen some animals hit by cars and such. Yeah. Or at least seen it in books and can understand what at least some parts might be. He saw that she was holding her stomach. She was filthy. She had tons of congealed blood around her head. Right. He could see all the veins and tendons in the gaping wound of her neck. She had been split open from ear to ear. Oh, my God. He heard her labored breathing and saw her severed windpipe. Mm -hmm. He immediately checked her pulse. It was faint. She was cold to the touch and her skin and tongue were pale, but she was alive and conscious, and very aware of him. Right. He saw something sticking out of her neck. He wasn't sure what it was, but he knew that he needed to keep it moist. Okay. So he stuck it back in her neck. He took off his own shirt and applied pressure to her neck. Other cars had stopped too. Someone else had some gauze, and he applied that too. Someone also had a torch, which he lit up for warmth on her face and to keep her looking at him. Okay. He had seen enough television to know that you need to keep a seriously injured person awake. Awake, yeah. So he talked to her. He told her how beautiful her eyes were, Mm -hmm. even though they were completely bloodshot. He calmed her and helped her to steady herself. She trusted him immediately, yeah. which is amazing mm-hmm. after what she just, just experienced these men, yeah. at the hands of men. Without telling her outright, he was trying to let her know that he was not going to let her die. Aww. This was 1994, and it was new technology, but thankfully one of Tian's friends had a cell phone. Oh, that saved a lot of time. So he called for emergency services. Not time yet. You're going to get mad. The hospital was 15 minutes away. And as the minutes passed, they weren't arriving and Tian was starting to panic, but he tried not to show this to Allison. Right. He asked her to stretch out her legs. He knew that she needed better circulation, but she couldn't stretch out her legs. Mm -hmm. For a while, she was trying to get him to focus on her stomach because she couldn't talk, but he didn't catch on at first. Yeah. When he did and looked past her denim shirt, he was horrified. All I could think is, where the fuck is the ambulance? Right. He knew that he was running out of time. Yeah. He called one of his friends over to start massaging her legs to help with her circulation. Okay. Another person brought over a blanket and covered her, which she remembers being just so thankful for because she's naked in front of all of these strangers. Oh, that's embarrassing. Yeah. And Tian just laid there with her, talking to her. He was her angel. In all the talking, even though she couldn't speak, he managed to come up with a system to narrow it down to the fact that two men had done this to her, that they raped her and stole her car. Right. They were yes or no questions, and she would squeeze his hand. One for yes, two for no. Okay. And he even managed to figure out what her car was through this. Wow. He just connected with her. That's all it was, is she trusted him, and yeah, yeah, he made her feel safe. Yes, He told her again that her eyes were beautiful and she smiled, but he could feel her pulse getting weaker. Yeah. He asked her if she had a boyfriend and she squeezed no. Quickly, he laughed and said, would you like one? (laughs) And she squeezed yes. And he smiled and said, so, you know, you have to make it because I need to take you out on a date and you have to pay because you ruined my shirt. (laughs) Aw. So they were like having a little flirtatious thing going on. She smiled again. She was just so comfortable with him. She really wanted to close her eyes and he kept telling her to keep them open. Yeah. She said she was flattered by him telling her more than once that her eyes were beautiful. And she was at this point where everything that she was doing, she was trying to do for him. She didn't want to let him down. Finally, almost two fucking hours later. Are you fucking kidding? The ambulance arrived. I'm surprised she's still alive. Two hours? Everything in this story is a miracle. Okay. The hospital is 15 minutes away and it nearly took them two hours. What the fuck? There are a lot of inconsistencies when it comes to how long it took the ambulance to show up. Some say 40 minutes and it goes up from there. But almost two hours is what is said by Tion in Allison's book. 
which okay. I'll talk about later. So I'm going to go with that. It is a firsthand account, and he confirms this in a minute when talking about what time she was finally inside the surgical theater in the hospital. Okay. I think some of the confusion when people are telling this story actually comes from the documentary and the way that they like piece together Allison and Tion talking about what happened around this time. Right. But, you know, a documentary versus the book. I'm going to go with the book. Yeah. So he's saying it took almost two hours. Anyway, by this point, everyone there was livid. Yes. Tion kept one hand on her throat and the other clutching her hand as they got into the ambulance. And again, Tian was angry because the ambulance wasn't speeding back to the hospital. Why? He begged them to go faster, but it was as if they already wrote her off. Oh. The medic in the back was trying to get a drip in and couldn't. So the driver stopped the ambulance, That's got fucked. in the back and did it. Or maybe they just got incompetent, you know, the new guys. I don't know. I feel like they were just wasting precious time for what is really fucking protocol, probably. Right. That they have to get this drip in. But a drip isn't going to save her life. No. Okay. Just get Doctors her to the hospital. are going to save yes. her life. Tion even had to yell at them to turn on their siren. That's so Which is, up. it's outrageous. Yeah. Eventually they get there. She was taken into surgery and he had to let go of her hand. But before he did, he told her he would be there when she woke up. And at this point, it's just after 4.30 a.m. Okay. Allison was abducted around one. Right. The entire ordeal with friends and TNs and Allison getting herself to the road took under 90 minutes. Mm -hmm. And the ambulance drew it out another two hours before she was in doctor's hands. And what they discovered was unbelievable. No one there had ever seen the brutality of Allison's wounds before. Okay. Not even with car accidents. Right. It was a frenzy with nurses trying to attend to her wounds. As she laid there wishing Tian was still with her, she realized that it was getting harder to breathe. Yeah. She knew that blood was starting to get into her windpipe. Mm -hmm. She was choking on her own blood. Everyone was so focused on her abdomen, no one noticed her labored breathing. She thought to herself, after all of this, I'm going to die. I'm going to die because they're all down there. Right. She waved her hands frantically and a nurse saw her, <laughs> saw her, suctioned the blood out, but then went back to her abdomen with the others. And then it happened again. And she waved her arms frantically. Finally, the nurse stayed with her this time. Okay. And I personally started crying during this part of her story because, I mean, I was never in her condition. But when I had my emergency C-section, they were all down at my belly, right. you know, wh which I understand. That's where the baby is. But this was after I almost coded. And so that's why they had to do the C-section. And I was starting to choke on my own vomit and no oh, one was seeing no one was me. There. And mm -hmm. I couldn't move my head. Yeah. I thought I was going to die while they were down there getting her out. It's such a it's helpless terrifying. feeling, right? Yeah. I can't imagine. Finally, someone noticed me and turned my head so I could throw up on the floor, but then just oh turned around and left me. And I'm just like, I feel like I was just this like vessel. And no, like, I didn't matter. focus on the baby. <laughs> yeah. So it's hard for me not to feel connected to Allison in this moment. But after they were done doing whatever they were doing, she was rushed out of that room down several halls to another room. She saw a doctor and thought that, OK, we're going to start surgery mm -hmm. because she's awake and lucid at this time. Right. But instead of doing that, they had to get her to sign a consent form because oh she's awake and lucid. That's fucked. It seemed ridiculous, but she was happy to do it because she took the opportunity to write down mom and her mother's phone number. And she could remember all this. This is just amazing. And they're just amazed at how steady she wrote. Yeah. If you look at her signature and the way she wrote, it did not look like someone who was in her condition right. at all. The doctors realized the extent of her injuries and knew they needed a specialist. Thankfully, the surgeon on call that day was trained in both specialties that she needed. That's which is a miracle. Super luck. Yeah. Her anesthetist was Dr. David Common. He played a crucial role in her survival. He presided over the emergency operations to stitch up her throat and abdomen after Dr. Dmitry Angelov performed several miracles. Yeah. <laughs> Dr. Angelov reattached everything and spent time meticulously cleaning every nook and cranny of her intestines. Wow. Even scrubbing some parts with a brush wow. to get every little bit of debris off of her. Mm -hmm. Overall, a lot of things lined up for this miracle. She was meant to survive it. Yeah, that's what it is. It's a miracle. Right. In all, Allison's neck was slashed 17 times. Wow. And she was stabbed 37 times in her chest, abdomen, and private area. Oh, my God. Later, we'll find out that the goal was to destroy her reproductive organs. Why? Men hating women. That's all yeah. it is. 
She was told it was very unlikely that she would ever be able to have children. Yeah. When Franz initially strangled her, he crushed her windpipe. Right. I remember you saying that. If they had just left her there, she would have died from lack of oxygen. Mm -hmm. But slashing her throat, they gave her mm -hmm. body the other way to breathe. Right. Because they cut straight through her trachea. Okay. Her anterior neck muscle and thyroid were also cut clean through. She was breathing out of a hole between her collarbones. Oh, wow. She was split, like I said, from ear to ear. When Tion stuffed something back in her neck, not knowing what it was, it was her thyroid. Oh. That saved her life in that moment. Dr. Angelov said that even just a nick of the thyroid during surgery can lead to substantial blood loss. Oh. Being pushed back in the way it was, it slowed down the bleeding. Okay. And amazingly, somehow, some way, despite the brutality in which the men cut at her, they didn't nick any of her major arteries or nerves in her neck. That's crazy. That's why she was able to... That's fucking crazy. She's completely sliced open and somehow they like dodged out of the way every single time they were slashing at her. Because she was meant to survive it. Yeah. Because if they had slashed any of these, she would have died in like three to four minutes. Yeah, that's what I was thinking when you said she slashed her neck. I was like, how did they? It's just insane. And they didn't get her voice box either. But even with that, the doctor still could not scientifically explain why she's not dead. Right. Right now. Coming to her abdomen and pubic area, her small intestines were completely exposed. Yeah. She was completely disemboweled. Outside of all of the debris, there were gashes in her intestines, but her bowels were clear. Okay. Remember, she emptied her bowels when she was being strangled, which I guess is a common reaction to being strangled. Right. But this also saved her life. If they had punctured her bowels while they were full, they could have have exploded. Yeah. Infection would have happened and she would die from that. And even if they were to get her all clean and fixed her all up in surgery, she could have still died from infection. Yeah. She had no infections after this. That's insane. The vicious stabs to her abdomen also did not puncture any of her organs. <laughs> These guys were just really bad. No, uh, I think it is just it a miracle. It has to be a miracle. It has to like, be a miracle. There's, it's just like the girl, this reminds me a little bit of the I-5 killer, the one that was shot in the head. And right. so they held her head and called yeah. 911 completely lucid. Like, yeah. you just don't know. Yep. Sometimes you're meant to survive it. Yep. The stabs to her chest did not hit her lungs or her heart. Over 50 stabs and slashes, and they missed all of the important things that keep us alive. It's amazing. Amazing. Because then you hear one stab to one person, and they die. Automatically, yeah. It took several hours, but they stitched her up and willed her out of the room. When Allison woke up, like he promised, Tian was there, and they both cried. Yeah. He saved her. Yeah, he did. I mean, the doctors did, (laughs) too. But without him, she would have died long before making it to the hospital. Mm -hmm. They didn't get together like in the movies. I kind of thought that they would. Yeah. But they bonded for life. And I'm going to come back to him in a little bit. Okay. Something very sweet happens between them. But even before her mother could get there, the police were there asking questions. They brought in a book of photos and Allison picked out both Franz and Tian's and wow. wrote down their names. Good. At this point, she had a tube down her throat going to her lungs and she couldn't talk. That was good enough for now. And they left, but they came back not too long after that same day and said that what they really needed was verbal admission of her attackers. Okay. Her doctors, understandably, were flabbergasted. They're like, she can't fucking talk, dudes. We just spent hours meticulously reconstructing her neck, specifically her trachea in this instance, and you want us to pull out a tube that can damage all that. So she can talk? She already pointed them out. They couldn't believe it. Dr. Common, who felt immediately attached to Allison. Well, yeah, how could you not? Very protective of her. He even stayed the night when he he didn't have to. He stayed the night with her into the next day. He wanted to make sure that she would survive. And in the documentary I was watching with him, in his old age, years, years later, he was still in tears just talking about her yeah that was i'm sure traumatizing for a lot of people that's probably the most (laughs) horrific case he'd ever encountered in his entire career yeah but the police said they needed it so he did what he had to and he went to allison and explained what the authorities were asking for he told her he did not agree with it he didn't think it was a good idea and he told her what the risks were and she wrote down on a pad for him and it just said take it out wow because she wanted them to she wanted them to pay She was adamant about it, so he did. And the first thing she said was, that's wonderful. She was happy to have the tube out. Oh, I'm sure. (laughs) And the next thing she said was, my attackers were friends and Tians. Awesome. She only knew their first names. Right. 
But that's what they needed, and they left to go track down these boys. And they weren't hard to find. They were at one of their flats. These sick motherfuckers went back home, got a bit of sleep, and woke up to make breakfast. They used the same knives that they used to slash up Allison to eat their breakfast with, and they didn't wash the knives first. Ew. Some sadistic way to, I don't know, keep living in what they had done. Disgusting. They were brought into the station and were told that they were being charged for not only rape, but attempted murder. Right. At first... They had no idea why they were being brought in because they thought Allison was dead and there was no way that someone found her already. Right. Is this like the day after? Yes, this is the next day. Okay. Technically the same day, actually. Yeah, because this happened in the morning. At 1 a.m. Yeah. But they didn't think anybody had found her and let alone tied it back to them already. Right. Okay. But when the cops had attempted murder, they both questioned this. What do you mean (laughs) attempted murder? And that's when they were told that Allison was still alive. And they were like, how? They were shocked. The detective on the case and who would be by Allison's side throughout the rest of the story and trial, Detective Melvin Humpel, said that you could have pushed Franz over with a feather. I'm sure. He was so shocked. Sadly, Melvin is no longer with us, but he was part of her documentary. And it was a beautiful reunion between the two. Oh. He died of a heart attack in 2020. It devastated his family. It was sudden. He was just sitting on a bench one Sunday, grabbed his chest, slumped over, and was gone. Mm -hmm. Very sad. Yeah. I just had to mention that because I'm sure Allison took it very hard. She had a lot of love for this detective. But at this time, Franz just essentially threw his hands up in the air, and then he took a ring off his finger and handed it to Melvin and said, here, this is Allison's. Oh, wow. So he admitted. And it still had blood on it. He didn't fight it. He said something like, well, if she's alive, then she's going to tell you everything anyway. Right. And they both gave full confessions and they were charged with rape and attempted murder and were held in jail awaiting trial. No bonding out this time. Good. Keep them (laughs) locked up. So they're in jail. She did it. She saved herself and they were arrested. Many people still hadn't seen her yet. The doctors actually asked them, you know, give it a few days before visiting her. So they did. A couple of her work friends visited her and couldn't hide their emotions. Yeah. They cried at the sight of her immediately. I'm sure. When Allison opened her eyes to look at them, they cried harder because both of her eyes were just filled with blood. Mm. It was a rough scene. Yeah. She was so happy to see them, though, and tried to crack a joke. She took her hand out from under the blanket and told them not to cry. She said, be happy. She was okay. Look, I didn't even break a nail. (laughs) And they all started laughing and crying because she did break several nails. Everything else. (laughs) Everything on her body was covered in wounds. Her nails were still dirty and broken and bloody. And throughout all of this, really, Allison remained strong for everyone else. There's that Virgo stuff that I was talking about. For a time anyway. Just 13 days later, a miracle again, Allison was well enough to leave the hospital. That's crazy. Crazy. This was on New Year's Eve, 1994. But this was just the start of her recovery. She moved in with her mother. She didn't want to be alone and she was going to need help with bathing and dressing her wounds for quite some time. Her mother was more than happy to be her caregiver. Some of her wounds didn't heal for a really long time. I saw pictures of these wounds and they are not pretty. I'm sure. She actually healed amazingly later. Like you almost can't see her neck wound. That's crazy. Which is crazy. She had some good doctors. Mm -hmm. (laughs) She had to heal from the inside out. Which, you know, that's how it is with like a C-section, right? Right, Any surgery. Everything you have to heal from the inside out. And so it was taking a long time. And she couldn't take an actual bath for a long time. Right. I'm not sure how long it took, but she said that when she finally could take a bath, that's the first time she let herself see her whole body. Like really look at herself and feel everything for what it was. And that's when she soaked it all in. And this, understandably, was a difficult time for her. Yeah. She had to keep up with a lot of appointments. She was in so much pain and the appointments just added more pain because for a long time she had to go almost daily to have her stomach scraped. It's already sensitive, but they had to scrape it and make it bleed until, you know, they could make sure that new skin cells were growing. Oh my goodness. Because it was such a massive wound. Yeah. She had more surgeries later on, plastic surgery. But some of these appointments she actually enjoyed, specifically with her main doctor, Dr. Angelov, because for a time she felt like he was the only one who understood her. Mm. Everyone else tiptoed around her and he didn't. He had one purpose to help her heal. Right. And was really straightforward about it with her. He didn't coddle her. They had serious conversations, but he pushed her to be strong and she was actually really sad when their appointments ended. And anytime the cops called on her for more evidence, she immediately went in. 
This included having to point out friends and Tians in the lineup. Okay. When I heard she had to do this, I was so frustrated for her. She already told them Seriously. and pointed them out. Like, why does she have to go see them in person and be traumatized? Exactly. And what's worse is at first, they wanted her to physically touch them. What? So prior to Allison's case in South Africa, the victim had to physically go up to their attacker and put their hand on their shoulder. That's to call them out. And her detective was like, I'm already putting her through so much. I am not making her do this. And he suggested the use of one way glass Mm -hmm. to allow Allison to point them out rather than re-traumatize her. Why would they ever, ever have that? I know. So silly. So it's been one way glass ever since Allison's case. Good. But even though there was glass between them, she was terrified. I'm sure. And she couldn't wait to get out of there. But she was able to point them out. And finally, it was official after three times saying... Hey, it's these guys. It's these guys. (laughs) And you guys know it's these guys. And they've already been convicted of rape. Come on. After this, she had to go into the station often for more tests and for strangers to take progress photos of her healing for evidence. Detective Humble didn't want there to be any chance that Franz and Tians could get a lesser sentence. Right. So he really did have to do everything because what you present to the prosecutor is all they can use. Okay. Okay. So he was doing everything that he could to make sure this was an impenetrable case. Right. But this included things that he would have rather not had to ask Allison for. Not only these photos, but they would have to pluck her pubic hairs. And this isn't a police office. And these are strange policemen who she's having to show her body to. So after being assaulted. Right. But she did it. You know, she did all of it without complaint. And that's a lot of trauma that she had to deal with. after. poor thing. And so many sexual assault survivors have to do this stupid shit. Like, I don't understand why I need to keep proving to you that I was gutted. Right. I specifically do not understand the purpose of having to pluck pubic hairs. Like, why would they need her pubic hairs? I know. That's what I'm saying. What's the point? That's not going to have any evidence on it at this point. I know. None of that part makes sense. So if you're a, I don't know, medical person and evidence or whatever, <laughs> tell me what the point of that is, please. Unless I don't they're understand comparing that. it to something on the men. No, because she's healing at this point. You know, we're six months or more down the That's road. It weird. doesn't make sense. But it was said multiple times. While awaiting trial in jail, Franz got to work on his story. At one point, he requested to see a pastor. Oh, now he's going to become Christian again? No. He said he was possessed by demons and needed an exorcism. I guess you can't deny someone a pastor. So this was approved and he supposedly underwent an exorcism. Okay. And this pastor, I guess, believed him and said that he successfully exorcised both an incubus and a succubus from Franz. (laughs) I don't believe you. (laughs) The trial started on June 12th, 1995. Detective Humple did not handcuff Franz or Tians. In fact, he told them he wasn't going to handcuff them because if they chose to run, he would shoot them. Good. He wanted them to run. Yeah. (laughs) He wanted the chance to make them pay for what they did to Allison. So amazingly, the two were never shackled the entire trial and they did not make a run for it, unfortunately. Yeah, because we know they're not going to get the death sentence because rape and attempted murder doesn't get that. Yeah, they do not have the death sentence in South Africa at this time. Okay, well, even more reason that they want to get the death sentence. (laughs) Yeah. Now, Allison didn't have to be there every day. It wasn't required of her. Okay. But she didn't miss one day Mm -mm. of the trial. It was important for her that they pay for their actions, but she said that she actually was pretty emotionally removed from all of it. People questioned why she would put herself through that kind of trauma. It's not trauma at that point. And also you being there reminds them that you did this to this human being that you have to look at in Mm -hmm. the courtroom. Like I could see why you might want to be there as the victim. What she said, it was like watching a courtroom TV drama. Right. What she likes. And she was actually surprised sometimes when they would say her name, like she'd snap out of it and be like, like, I'm the person. Yeah, uh, this is about me Mm -hmm. you know she said the hardest thing for her was actually just all the media attention yeah because she had a part to play it wasn't common for rape victims to have their identity known to the public Mm, okay she wanted to show other women that it's okay to come forward Mm -hmm. and what was amazing is the two women from before actually did testify and established you know this is the pattern of these two men good so i'm glad they got their justice in a way too with this yes when Franz took the stand, and I'm sorry, I go in between Franz and Franz. I don't know. It's whatever. whatever comes out of my mouth at this point. He's an care. asshole, so we don't care. <laughs> there was absolutely no attempt to show any remorse from him. Yeah, well, he had none, so, but he yeah. just didn't pretend. It was the devil made me do it bullshit. He did bring that up, but he was like confusing an incubus and a succubus, and everybody was like, <laughs> you're stupid. 
But when recounting what happened, he was really cold. No emotion. He kind of told everybody what happened, like giving directions. Yeah. So, like, and then I did this and that. No regret about it. You no, know, you yeah. brutally attacked a human being. And so. he's like, whatever. Now, remember, Franz is married with a child. Oh, yeah. I forgot about that. <laughs> Could you imagine that being your husband? I know. Uh, his wife stood by him through all say, of this. Divorce papers would be <laughs> right away. But she didn't. I'm sure there was like this level of abuse in their relationship as well. And she felt like she had to stay by him. They did eventually split. I just don't know at what point Yeah. after this. But in the trial and in the media, she stood by his side. So wow. I don't know how anyone stands by no. a person after what they did to Allison. No. I don't understand. I don't know. Maybe she was scared that he was going to get off somehow and come I home. I don't uh. know. Or maybe she was brainwashed. Maybe she thought he was this all powerful being. The devil That stuff. was supported yeah. by the devil or he was the devil. Maybe she was satanic too. Yeah, I think she had to have some of that to be with him because yeah. that's what he was all about, right? Tians, he didn't take the stand at all, but he also showed no remorse, no emotion. In the end, both pled guilty to eight charges that included kidnapping, rape, and attempted murder. On August 7th, 1995, they were found guilty on all charges. Franz was sentenced to three life terms and Tians was sentenced to one life term plus 25 years. Wow. OK, they got a good sentence. And because of the brutality of this case, the judge, Judge Chris Jansen, did something he had never done and never did again after this case. He wrote how he felt about the case and suggested to anyone that might come upon them in the future, like a parole board or something. Right. No, don't give them parole. Exactly. Mm -hmm. He never wanted them out of prison. He said good. they would reoffend. They're too dangerous. They're a threat to the public. Right. He made it clear. This is how I feel. Feel, let it be known. Yes. Because they didn't have the death penalty, as we said. That wasn't an option. He said if it was an option, he would have pushed for it. That's awesome. And that's not the type of person he actually is, but he would have in her case. Yeah, it was brutal. And I'm not sure where to put this, so I'm just going to mention it now. After everything that happened, Franz's father couldn't handle it, and he sadly committed suicide oh. two years after this. It's hard to accept that your child is a monster. We don't know what their home life was like. No. But to me, even though they went about it wrong, it seemed like his parents tried. They were constantly trying to get through to him in some way. It would be hard to be the parent of a child who does something atrocious. It really, I know. Like, I think about that with all these, like, mass shooting. I know. The parents. Yeah. And, yeah. It's so easy to blame the parents. Mm-hmm. But but sometimes someone's just off and you can't no matter help what you do. Yeah. You can try and be loving. You can try and do this. You can try and give them opportunity. And sometimes you're not sure if punishing or coddling is going to make them be the better person. You don't actually know. And maybe neither will. And what happened to Allison is beyond anything they thought he was capable, capable of. of. Yeah. You know, so anyway, just had to mention that. After the conviction, it was now time for Allison to try and rebuild her life. Mm -hmm. But she fell into a major depression and blamed them for ruining her life, obviously. Yeah. Up to this point, she had been so strong for everyone, but she folded. She couldn't work. She didn't want to talk to anyone. She had a hard time doing much of anything, which is understandable. Uh, yeah. <laughs> She wasn't ashamed of what happened to her, but this type of thing, it changes you. Like, how could it not? She couldn't go back to life as it was before. No way. And people couldn't wait for her. You know, this happened to her, not everyone else. Right. Her mother gave up everything to help her, but that's her mom. Yeah. Everyone else had responsibilities. They life had to move on. on with their yeah. lives. So she was lost for a while. That was until one day she got a phone call and she was asked to speak about her experience at a Rotary Club. OK. She had always been terrified of giving speeches, but she said yes. Mm -hmm. And doing this changed everything for her. Good. She realized that it helped her. And at the same time, she could help others. And finally, it was time for her to live again. And she wouldn't give them any more of her life than she already had. I don't know. Sometimes it feels morbid looking at the brighter side of things. Yes. I would never wish what happened to Allison. On anyone. On anyone. Yeah. The men who did it to her, sure. Yeah, let them die a slow, painful death. But before this, she didn't really have any real aspirations in life. And this horrific event gave her her calling. Her purpose was to be this advocate. Yep. Mm -hmm. And we can't be an advocate in a passionate way without having this like Personal. inner knowledge right. of what something is. Not long after this, while at a party, she met a man and started dating him. I secretly wished that she would have gone with Tian, yeah. <laughs> but that would have been too perfect a story, right. I think. She married this man a couple years later. 
remember, the doctors told her it would be impossible for her to have children. Yeah. Friends and Tians attacked her viciously mm-hmm. in her private area to be sure of that. But miraculously, just a few years after she got married, she got pregnant. Wow. And without any intervention. Or She's without just a miracle help, person. Yep. She just got pregnant one day. Of course, she was worried if she'd yes. be able to carry it to term. She was worried if it would just like rip her apart inside. You know, right. she didn't know how well she was put back together in there. But she had a beautiful little boy without complications. Wow. And then she had another boy. Wow. Both were healthy pregnancies, healthy boys. And Tian, who was a veterinary tech student before coming upon Allison, he was inspired to become an actual doctor. Oh. It took 10 years and he helped deliver her second child. That's amazing. Which is crazy special. So sweet. Crazy, crazy special. After Allison spoke at the Rotary Club, she dedicated her life to helping victims of violence and sex crimes. Like I said, she was never ashamed of what had happened to her. Yeah. It happened. Right. And she just she needed to find a way to move on. And she did that through motivational speaking. That's awesome. She wanted to encourage other women who had similar experiences to come forward. Good. She wanted them to know that they weren't alone. Mm-hmm. As it becomes clearer every day, it's more of us than we can grasp. It's so many. She traveled all over the world giving speeches and made Many have admitted that she has helped them heal. Good. She speaks often about something that helped her move on, but that also helps her just in small everyday decisions. And she calls it her ABCs. It's really simple, actually. A for attitude, B for belief, C for choice. She's saying you can't control what happens to you, but you can control what you choose to do with it. Okay. Allison managed to take the most horrific thing that can happen to someone Mm -hmm. and turned it into something positive, something hopeful. Yes. Which says a lot about who she is. Yeah, definitely. It would be all too easy to go the opposite route. To just slip into depression and just stay there. Find ways to soothe yourself. Mm-hmm. I don't know, you know, substance abuse, Addiction, alcohol yeah. abuse. And I get it. I understand if that's where you go with something. It's trauma. Right. I would never judge anyone we, for any of that. And nobody knows how you will react until it happens to you. Right. But, you know, I really give it to her for turning this around into something else entirely. Me too. She went on to write a book with the help of Marion Tam. It's called I Have Life, which is what I read for this. And as I mentioned in the beginning, there's also this documentary. It's simply called Allison. But before this came out, she had to experience something pretty fucking outrageous. Okay. (laughs) I don't know how, but somehow Franz was allowed to have Facebook in prison. Oh, no. Which allowed him to have several relationships over the years. Why would any woman want a relationship? (laughs) This included an American girl who became his fiance. I don't know who she is or where she lived here in America. But that girl's mother had the audacity to write to Allison and asked her for help in speaking up for Franz and helping him get released so that he could properly be with his soon-to-be wife. Are you fucking kidding me? No. I don't even know how I would respond to that woman if I was Allison. It would not be kind. I mean, she didn't respond what to the her. actual fuck? Yeah. yeah. He abducted her. He raped right. her. He choked her. He wanted he her dead. Her over 50 yes. times. And do you think... That's an appropriate person for your daughter? I mean, crazy. Crazy. What I don't know. I don't fuck? know. But they thought he was possessed. I'm sure he told them some sob I bet story. you it's kind of this cult thing that he can do with people. Yeah. It's just amazing. Understandably, this shocked her. Uh, yeah. She wrote to the authorities about it. Now, keep in mind, these two have never shown remorse. No. Ever. There has been no coming to Jesus stuff. No apologies of any kind That's over the horrible. years. So she writes to the authorities, letting them know what happened. How did this woman get my information? Yeah. This can't be allowed to happen. You know, she brought up her concern that he has Facebook. How does he right. have this kind of access in prison? She requested that her communication in writing this is kept confidential. And what happens? Oh, God. Somehow, Franz got his hand on a copy of what she emailed. To the cops? Yes. Guess he has some prison guards or someone high up who thinks he's all that or whatever. But he got a copy of what she said. So what did Franz do with that? He published it. Well, he took it as an opportunity to write out some demands. Why? (laughs) He has no leverage. He found out that she was doing a documentary and he wrote to the producers demanding three things. One, he wanted a letter of forgiveness from Allison signed. Uh, Fuck no. He's just a psychopath. Two, he wanted a share of the proceeds from the documentary. You're in fucking prison, dude. Three, he wanted a share of the profits of the sales from Allison's book and her motivational speaking career backdated. Oh, because he was the one that made her? Yes. By raping and killing her? Exactly. He said if it wasn't for him attacking her, then she would 
would have never had her success story. Okay, he's a complete narcissist, psychopath, sociopath, well, every word that I can think of right now, that's what he is. Yeah. What the hell? It's just disgusting. And it's just horrible that she has to deal with this nonsense. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, would she have gone to give speeches around the world about rape and violence against women? Probably not. But no. I'm sure she would have preferred to not have had to experience what the fuck you did to her. Exactly. It's just the audacity of these people. Of this crazy ass man. Of course she refused his demands. Uh, yeah. <laughs> but it's unsettling, you know, to still have this like almost like this level of communication mm-hmm. going on yes. with this person that she should have nothing to do with ever right. again. She shouldn't have to no. think about them. Because she admits that the one thing that would send her back into a depression would be if Franz or Tian's got ever got released. Out. Yeah. And, and this is when we get angry. Oh no, did they get out? Because they were. I'm I feel it boiling my blood. In July of last year, 2023. Oh my god. Franz and Tian's were both released from prison. Why? After 28 years in prison, even though they were told they would never get out and the judge requested they were never released, they were put out on parole. Oh my god. In South Africa in 2012, a law changed that allowed inmates with life sentences to apply for parole as long as they served at least 13 years. Okay. I don't understand why are we even giving life sentences? The whole purpose of a life sentence is because this person is a fucking danger to society who never needs to be out again. Why would parole even be an like I'm just I don't understand. I'm Especially tired. Especially in Franz's case. He was given three life sentences so how do you let him out? I'm tired of this. And it's in every fucking country. And even in Franz's case, if, you know, the whole point is if you're given a life term, it has to be at least 13 years. Then shouldn't his be 39 if he was given right. three? Right. But no. And I don't understand. They're not the same person. OK. But they were released at the same time. Right. Which feels really negligible. What? Right. I don't understand. How? So what? So that they could get out, catch up and get back together. Start and start plotting. over. I don't understand what the fuck. What the actual fuck. Are they in Port Elizabeth? Watch out. If they're you're a in, woman there. They are in South Africa. I don't know where they were released. And Allison was told the day before they were released. Oh, my God. I can't imagine the horror she felt finding out. She's afraid for her life now until one of them dies. I would be like, like, imagine. I know. She's out there speaking about them. They I know. are angry. They're I psychopaths. Know. Like, I would be afraid. And I was watching this. I don't know if he was a guard or something in South Africa. He was explaining why they were released and why anybody in this, you know, situation is released. And he was explaining how they keep track of these guys after because they will be on parole for the rest of their lives. But we know that they don't but watch them. But they don't them. do much. He Kenneth was, McDuff was on parole, exactly. too. And he, the way he was listing it off, well, they have to tell us if they're changing addresses i'm like no they don't that's not enough they're just not going to tell you dummy that's what they do that's they can hop wherever they want and by the time you found them they've already killed or raped 20 other women i know i pray to god that they get rearrested for something else but not hurting a woman i was about to say but they're going to because i mean now someone else is hurt they've been in prison for almost 30 years with no sex exactly they're not just all of a sudden going to be suddenly sexually abstinent here's the way i look at it no they hate women even more if you want to let them out you better have chemically fucking castrated them yes yeah it's and it's not like they're elderly they're in their 50s why more than capable of still continuing everything and i'm guessing south africa doesn't like have an overcrowding population there's other lesser criminals that they could have let out than somebody who basically killed a woman they thought they killed her their whole reason was is they believe in reformation exactly these guys there are some men who are beyond that and especially if they do something this despicable yes i mean all you have to look at is what they did to her yeah I don't understand. I I just don't. I truly feel so horrible for Allison to have to deal with the reality that they're out. And so many women mostly have to deal with their oppressor getting away with stuff. Mm -hmm. This is like a very super extreme case of it. And then they usually go on to do something even worse. Yes. We just never learn from history or we do learn from history and they just don't they fucking don't fuck, care. They don't care because we're women. And because we're women. They've made it very clear in the last several years and I guess all of history that women don't matter as much as men. Yeah. But let's do what Allison has done. All these years, we're going to scooch back over to the positive side. Yeah. <laughs> I'm so happy that she survived. Me too. I'm so happy that she turned everything around and has helped countless others. Me too. And she has a beautiful family. And she has children. It's an unbelievable story. It is. It's a story of sheer will to live. 
I want to believe that I would be as strong as she was, but I don't know. No. She's supernatural. What she did was unbelievable, and there's just no other word for it. No. It's, it's miracle. All unbelievable. But her story isn't just about that. I truly think she just wasn't supposed to die. No, she was meant to. It was like this calling for her to do what she's doing now. Yes. So many things happened to keep her alive. She had over 50 stab wounds. None hit major arteries, nerves, or vital organs. How? Right. How does someone with her neck and stomach wide open survive? And not just for a while. Before surgery, she was in that state for almost three hours, possibly even longer. Crawling, walking, passing out, falling. Yes. The fact that she emptied her bowels before being gutted. Yep. If she hadn't, perforating her bowels would have killed her. She was disemboweled. If her shirt hadn't been thrown at her at the last moment before they left, she wouldn't have had a way to put her intestines back in and hold yep. herself so she could get to the road. Tian, a vet tech student, happened to be the one there that right. night on the road. And knew what to do. And he had that level of compassion that not everybody has. True. And he put the thyroid back in her throat. Right. And he kept her awake. He became the reason that she wanted to make it at that moment. His friend had a cell phone. <laughs> Right. All of this is just, it's not coincidence at that point. It's like a universal power or Mm -hmm. something. Right. And the surgeon on call that day happened to be an ENT specialist and could handle her general surgery of her stomach. Right. She survived to tell her story, put them away to make sure they couldn't do this to anyone else. She went through so much and now they're out. Make it make sense. I don't want to go down talking about it again, but it 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 just, it's so fucked up. Yep. But I'll end in her words. She will say (laughs) out of everything she went through, all of the miracles that happened for her, her number one miracle was having her boys. Of course. And being a mom, that is her wealth. So, Allison, I wish nothing but the best for you. Right. And I truly hope that even though they were let out, you can find a way to do what you've already been doing yes. and just continue being happy and know that you've touched so many people around the world. Right. We're so happy you're here. Allison, you're an inspiration to so many women and you've helped so many. I am beyond disgusted that the men that did this to you are out roaming the streets right now. And I'm thinking about you and hope that you're able to work through that. That just happened. So we only wish the best for you. I hope you have lots of money to go into hiding or something and Seriously. that they can never find you. So that is the story of Alison Bota, her amazing, amazing survival story. It's beyond something that we can comprehend, I think, in reality. But she was meant to be here. And I'm glad that it ended in the way that it did. Me too. (laughs) Finally, a survival story. I know because so many women don't get to survive and tell that story. And that's why it makes me so mad. She had the chance to have this justice. I know. And it's ripped away from her. Yeah. And I just, I truly hope something happens so that not another woman has to meet them. Yeah, I hope that both of them meet a really unfortunate end. Very painful. I don't wish ill on most people, but... I'm sorry, you don't get to slash a person open and then and just I, get to get a job and go to work. And it would be life. one thing if they had like come out publicly and been like, oh, my God, I was a stupid child. Allison, I'm so sorry. Like, this isn't who I am anymore. It doesn't sound like they've done that. No. And they still got released. Like they I haven't know. done anything that tells me that they are going to be a different person than they were 20 years ago or whatever. It's just the fact that they were released together. Again, I said it before. They're different people. That tells me that it's a lazy system yep. and they just let them out. And maybe, you know, demons do walk this earth and I think they do. The two of them are. And that's why they're out. Yeah. So because there's demons everywhere in government and everywhere else. So who knows? But anyway, well, thank you for bringing Allison's story of survival. Yeah. We need some happy endings. I know we don't always have that with the stories we bring. I know. I'm so thankful she was able to move on and. Well, she has her two beautiful babies and both of us being mothers, we know how much joy that brings to your life. So I'm glad she had those miracles. (laughs) Me too. Thank you for listening, everyone. Yes. We don't have anything really fun to say. I know. going to wrap it up. This was a sobering episode, even though there's positive outcome here. You know, it's still it's, it's a still rough one to talk about because of them being let out. Yep. And it just it hurts to hear that kind of thing amongst everything else that's going on to women right now. I know it just brings it all back. So if you have any lab reports, a similar story, you know of something else you want us to cover, please email us at lucidlabpodcast at gmail.com. We are on all of the social media. We are at Lucid Lab Podcast, all one word, on TikTok, YouTube, Facebook, and Instagram. 
We'll be back every Tuesday yes. with a new episode. I have a very interesting two-parter coming next. Yes. It's and... a cult. <laughs> I haven't done a proper cult, and I am very excited about this I one. I am very excited about it, too, because in all honesty, you wouldn't catch me being the one covering this. No. And you'll see why. But I think it'll be very interesting being the person listening to everything that Kendra has to say, because I grew up with some of this. And it's a controversial one. I'll give you that. I have read six books because I want (laughs) to make sure I present this properly. So come back. It will be good. It will be worth two parts. It's going to be hard. I could almost make it a three-parter, but we're going to keep we'll, it to two. <laughs> we'll see. We'll see what happens. Could be a three-parter. Yeah. I'm know. warning you now, but it's a good story. So it's what we do. We can't leave out details once we find them. That's the I hard know. part for us. That is so <laughs> hard because it also, I don't know, it just, it gives you the flavor to mm-hmm. the story. Without it, you're just, I don't know, it's just facts. No. We anyway, like to guys, go deep. So come back. And in the meantime, stay lucid. Practice those ABCs and whatever you do, please believe women. It's that simple. Always. Goodbye. See you soon.